Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest in a series of webinars uh, from Sony. My name is Peter Sykes. I'm working for Sony Professional. I'm based in Europe, and I'm the host for this uh, webinar, which is going to take about uh, one hour uh, this afternoon. We're hosting the webinar in Sony's Digital Motion Picture Center uh, in Pinewood Studios, and we really would like to extend a warm welcome to you who have joined us uh, this afternoon. So it will take about one hour. There will be some um, opportunity uh, for questions and answers. So we, we really want you to enter uh, any questions that you have on your mind that you'd like to put to the two, uh, sorry, the three uh, people on the uh, sofa, which I will introduce to you in a few seconds time. Um, there will be some questions that we will be asking you as well. So we'll be polling you uh, uh, at the uh, various points within the webinar. And also at the end, there will be a question and answer session where you can, uh, we can run through the questions that you've put to uh, the panelists today. There'll also be a, a poll that we will ask you a, a feedback summary at the end of the webinar, which we'll use to really uh, design uh, webinars in the future based upon the input and the, uh, the requirements that you have as the audience. So without um, further delay, I'd like to introduce you to the three gentlemen that have joined me today. And starting on my immediate right uh, with Shams, uh, you're an award-winning um, filmmaker and cinematographer and are really specialising in a lot of action and uh, adrenaline fueled yep. production. <laughs> so we'll have a good opportunity to get all the details of what is in, uh, involved in that uh, sure. as we go through the webinar. Uh, further along the sofa, we have Jezza Newman, um, a five times BAFTA award-winning documentary filmmaker also a winner of the 2011 uh, Rory Peck Award. Uh, Jezza, you are also um, find yourself in some really um, unusual situations, a lot of work that yeah. you were telling me you're working with, uh, the effects on children around the world of various conflicts in certain areas, and we're really get, looking forward to getting a good um, idea about that. And then on the far side of the sofa, uh, one of my colleagues from uh, Sony, uh, Sebastian, Sebastian Leske, who's here, uh, from Germany for the day and is working as a product specialist uh, for our cameras, a lot of the large format sensor cameras and the tools that are available for documentary uh, filmmaking. So I think what we'll do to kick things off, we'll have a look at some of the, uh, the content that you've been shooting, Shams, and just take an opportunity to see some of the work and some of the situations that you find yourself in. So Shams, that's uh, fantastic uh, footage that you've shot there. And the title of today's webinar is A Guide to Better uh, Documentary Filmmaking. Can you just give us a little bit of an idea, introduction as to building upon the pictures we've seen of well, what you typically spend your time doing? Well, um, I started in uh, 2011. I quit my job actually in 2010 to, to do only filmmaking. And at this time I was doing a lot of climbing and paragliding, this kind of, of sports. So um, when I start to make movie, uh, I took naturally the way of action uh, filmmaking, and I start filming the sports I was doing, obviously. Okay. And Jezza, just uh, moving on to, to yourself, we haven't had a chance to see uh, your images uh, just yet. So just for the, the, the audience, if you just summarize the kind of um, uh, projects that you look at, the, 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 the content that you're you're shooting yeah, the subject matter. I mean, <coughs> we, um, I very much have ended up in a world where I'm making films to make a difference. So we're basically looking at subject areas, looking in, in conflict, you know, on the edge of conflict zones or in countries under, under oppressive regimes and, and looking at what is life like for the ordinary person. I've also made documentaries here in the UK looking at people living in poverty or in homelessness. So these sorts of people on the fringes of society, if you like, and, and those that 
often go unheard, unspoken, and therefore I've very much told films through the perspective of children. Um, and that's purely because children often are unseen, unheard, but have a really strong voice. And um, it's amazing how many kids, you know, really have an, an articulation way beyond their years. So that's an area I've looked in. And by default, um, I've ended up sort of working in a lot of areas sort of undercover, covertly, um, in places like China, Tibet, Kashmir. Um, I've been to Gaza as well, so places like that, but also here in the UK as well. Okay. And Sebastian, um, your background is from, obviously, from the supplier side. Yep. Um, what are the kind of things that you get involved in, specifically around you know, tech tools for uh, documentaries, filmmaking, etc.? Um, so as you mentioned, so I'm working as a product specialist for Sony, and I'm responsible for the uh, large format sensor camera, so in F5, 55, 65, and I really got involved uh, when we made the first ideas about uh, making a really good tool and tool set for these, um, for these guys. And um, yeah, I was part of the planning and development team for the FS7, and yeah, we got really into it. We um, worked, we walked, or um, discovered, or visited uh, productions uh, around the world to really get the feeling what these guys need and to make a proper tool for them. So this was my start, really, to dig into um, the needs for documentary filmmakers. Okay. So Shams, Jezza, if we think of the whole timeline of a project. And we go right back to the start time, the starting point. So you've just maybe uh, found out that you're going to be involved in a particular um, a documentary. You're right at the beginning of the, the process of, of, of setting up to get ready. What are the first things that you have to do before you, you know, travel on to the location? What are the first things in the project that you work on? Well, I would say it depends on... Uh, of the project, if each project are different, and if you're shooting a commercial or a documentary, it's not the same thing, and it's quite obvious also. But uh, regarding your budget, you have it's not uh, the same preparation. Um, I was shooting a commercial last April. Um, we got some helicopters to bring uh, three F-55 on top of a mountain, so that's easy. But I remember the day I was uh, filming on top of Kilimanjaro and I have to hike uh, on top. So I prefer to bring a smaller camera like a 7 s or something light and making good pictures. So the preparation of a project is really depending on what we want to shoot, uh, what story we want to tell and what, what camera we want to bring, of course. We yeah, can. I mean, <coughs> for us, too, you know, it's, um, we have a docu in, do in the documentary world, um, um, most broadcasters will ask you to fill out a risk assessment. A risk assessment is a document that basically acts as your planning tool, if you like. And uh, so you will have the sections of equipment, like um, is Shams was mentioning, you know, so that's one section of it. What cameras are you going to take? Mm -hmm. Um, what supplies you're going to take, and then it's about where you're going to stay. Then you've got a section on the political situation of the country you're going into. So you might be thinking you're telling this innocent story of, of a guy living homeless in, in Ghana, but you don't know that suddenly you might be falling into this other world that's politically sensitive, and before you know it, you're banged up because you stepped across a line. So you need to know, you need to know not just about the situation that you're going into and plan on filming, but what's going on around you. Um, and, and I think that that's, uh, and, and then you look at um, where you're going to stay, how you're going to travel, how you're going to exit, and then also right down to what happens after the film goes out. You know, what's your strategies for um, the people you leave behind afterwards? So, I mean, that, that is something that I think that can't be undervalued or understated is, is that planning process um, and that adaptability, you know. For Shams, I'm sure there's been a million times he's been on top of a mountain and the wind changed direction and suddenly that's caused them, you know, huge grief if you're paragliding or blizzard comes in on a mountain. You, you can't predict everything, but you can at least set out some parameters to cover yourself. Yes, okay. that's for sure. Like, um, doing a project is a lot of work during the project, during the shooting time, but it's many, many days before of planning everything. And weather is very challenging for us because all the spots we are shooting are really weather dependent, paragliding, skydiving, uh, speed riding. Uh, if you are in the middle of um, a snowstorm and you cannot shoot anything during five days and you have a 
seven days uh, window shooting, you know, um, it's quite challenging. So you need to secure a plan, plan A, but a plan B, plan C, plan, plan D, and, and be really flexible about what you can do and adjust your schedule of the day regarding every small factor. Okay, so we'll come back to that in a, just a second, but I think we've got the first uh, poll question that should be appearing on uh, your screens now. And basically what we'd like to know is how many of you, what percentage of you who are watching today are actually working in the field of a documentary. So if you just take a look at the question, give your answer, and then in a few minutes, uh, we'll review the, um, the response and the percentage from uh, the viewers that are yourselves that are watching today. Okay, so you've done your pre-preparation, a little bit of loss of risk assessment, uh, looked at the environment that you're going into. At what point do you start to think about the type of equipment that you'll use for the documentary itself? Shams, when, when do you start? Is that right at the beginning or is that something that becomes more apparent as the, um, you know, the, the story that you're trying to tell becomes clearer in your mind? Yeah, like um, the gear you are going to bring is just a tool to deserve the story you are going to tell to your audience. So obviously, it can help you to, to, to give some nice uh, uh, feeling, like uh, action cam on the paraglider is going to help to give this feeling of flying, obviously. But um, the gear I'm going to choose before uh, shooting a project is depending also of the quality I want to give to this, uh, to this documentary. Um, I was uh, two weeks ago in Arizona filming a um, documentary about skydiving, a uh, woman world recon. And I had the chance to, to use a little bit the FS7 II, Mark II. And it was great because I was just on the ground running a little bit everywhere. Uh, while my main collaborator, Alex, was filming in the sky, uh, skydiving with a girl. And, and again, if, if, because I was on the ground, FS7 Mark II was a good choice for me. Uh, if, I, if I was going to go in a difficult condition, high mountain or something where the weight is important, maybe I would have chose FS5 A7S because it's lighter. So I'm going to choose my gear regarding what I want to shoot and where I'm going. And it has to be easy, but also a good quality. Yeah, I mean, it's the same um, <coughs> with the work I'm doing, except that um, I'd say that probably the quality of the image is almost a secondary factor in many respects. And in, in that, if I'm working, I'm either working covertly or I'm working in close proximity and, and I want a sense of in intimacy. I self-shoot everything. So my equipment needs to be portable. I need to be able to carry it with me wherever I go in the world. If that's, you know, taking a UN flight or a UN helicopter in a refugee camp zone to, um, you know, traveling across America, whatever I'm doing, I'm carrying my equipment and using it. Obviously working covertly, the camera, what's really important is, the, is, is what fits in with the cover story that you're following. So it'd be wonderful. Yeah, sure, take a beautiful, big, cinematic, camera however going into China we need to be tourists so we need the smallest camera going so we shot that on an A1 because that was the smallest camera that gave us broadcastable imagery right so in those days it was DV but that was you know there's you know verging on acceptable um, we got away with it it's fine um, moving on to Zimbabwe Z5 was the camera of choice for me not the Z7 um, or any other um, further you know cameras of larger format um, better quality because the Z5 shot to tape and card, which is really important for us because we could have tourist images on the tape and um, the footage we were truly shooting on the card. So, you know, it's it's horses for courses. You know, um, the Z5, you uh, you're able to keep tapes um, as your sort of backup story and then put the footage onto a hard drive in secret petitions. But you'd always have had something to hand over. Whereas in China, formerly, when I was in China and Tibet, we would shoot on tape, we'd have to down convert it to hard drive, and then we'd have to burn the tapes on top of a mountain because we couldn't hang on to them because obviously then you're not doing anything by hiding them on the drive. So, you know, the camera changes to the environment you're in, but I'd say for me, it's always about keeping something that, that is part of me as much as possible. Okay, I think we've got um, the first result in uh, now. 
Uh, the, the question was, uh, do you work on documentaries? And just looking at the results here, 67% uh, of the, uh, the viewers are working in documentary and 32.7% are not. So quite a lot working in the, the documentary area, which is good news. It means that I think most of you have actually logged into the correct webinar, which is always good to know. Uh, so Seb, is there anything that you want to add at this point, no, just to bring um, you in? So what I just want to say, so this is exactly the thing. So there is no one horse or one shirt fits all. And uh, when, when we, we have planned uh, the developing of the FS7, this was directly our mission to say, okay, let's concentrate on the documentary market and what is important for these guys, so to support them as best as possible. And we haven't thought from the first instant to about feature set. We, we just started with the ergonomic point of view, the usability point of view, to say, okay, um, this is where they need to operate it as, as much as possible. So with a hand grip, with a design <coughs> to fit in the, in the needs. And of course, when the FS7 was launched, the original one, we got then the request or feedback to say, okay, nice but could be also perhaps a bit smaller to be even more invisible, even more uh, flexible for some uh, circumstances. So this was then the result where the FS5 came into it. And um, so, yeah, I think this is quite important that um, it's not the feature set itself which is important for you. It's more how, how, the, uh, how the guys can use the camera to, to be uh, flexible and to, to get the proper shot in, in the time they have. But I think even that, you know, it's, it's just like our pre-planning and everything. You can think of the camera that Seb might suggest to you it's the best one. But until you're out there in the field using it, you're never really going to truly know. I went to Amazon recently. I took an A7S and I took a FS5 and put to, I shoot... And when I shoot an interview, I use both cameras, right? So I use one, the, the A7 on a wide and the FSF tighter. And, um, and basically, 35 minutes into an interview, the A7 was shut down because it would overheat because the humidity levels in the Amazon and the amount of heat that was there, it didn't like it. It would shut it. No one, I wouldn't have known that before I went there. You know it gets hot with 4K. I was shooting Ultra HD at the time. So you know it overheats. The FS5 never overheated because it had this fantastic cage built into the bottom, right? An aeration system, right? However, if you're then climbing down a slippery slope and you trip on a slippery rock and you fall in a puddle like I did, or a pond, or, or a river really, and your FS5 falls in it too, that lovely aeration cage now is open to the elements and you fry your camera, which is what happened to me. The upside of it all though was somehow, I'm, I'm sure Seb will tell you they deliberately did this, but the, um, the housing for the SD cards seems to be super watertight because whilst the whole camera died, the footage on the SD cards was absolutely perfectly fine. Um, A7S handled the water, the wet, much, much better because obviously it's designed to do so. But it was interesting for me that this, you know, this, this um, something that was designed to help the camera run in hot environments could also have a failing in, in wet environments. So mm. you need to kind of think through what are you doing, where are you doing? You know? And Shams, I guess you go through the same thought process when you're you know, working out how you're going to shoot and what equipment, because as we saw on your, uh, your, your short film there, you work in some pretty hostile environments, don't you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I remember one time in Lofoten Island in Norway uh, last winter, and we had to change lenses during the snowstorm uh, while we were shooting some uh, skiing action. And we were just like, if we thought uh, before coming here like, that maybe we will have some uh, issues just changing lenses, maybe we should have just uh, bring um, uh, 18, one, one, 120, or I, I don't know, something, uh, lens like this. And because of a small mistake like this, you can ruin your day shooting because when you switch your lenses, you can have some snow on your sensor. And then, uh, okay, what, what are we doing now? We, we need to wait. So again, it's about preparation and about choosing the right gear for the right shooting. And there is not, there is not one camera uh, that is going to work every time. Um, you just need to think about what you want to to shoot and the condition you are going to shoot. And 
and that's it. And that, that might change. You know, environments change. The mm. situation you you went into, you thought would be one environment, one climatic environment, but for whatever reason, that time, that period that you're there, it's a completely different environment. So again, it's about being able to adapt. You know, so when we talk about this risk assessment, it doesn't mean you kind of write it before you go, and that's it. You know, it's like telling a story. You don't say, right, this is what the film's about, go to the country and make the country fit the story. You, you've got to look at what's on the ground there. And you're obviously seeking a certain journey about if it's children in poverty or children without education. Sure, you follow that journey, but you try to look around you and see how it might adapt and change. Same with equipment, same with your risk assessment. You're, you're, you're updating it every day that you're there. You know, um, and, and the risk assessment isn't just about equipment. You know, it's very much about, like I mentioned before, you know, it's about... Where are you going? What are you doing? And this, at the outset, the stage that you're planning this, it can seem a bit crazy because you're writing about this. You know, I'd never been to Tibet before. So I'm writing about this hypothetical restaurant where I'm going to meet these hypothetical people to talk about these hypothetical things. And then these hypothetical secret police are going to come on and try and stop me. Right? But I need to work through that and write about what am I going to do? How am I going to do that? How am I going to assist, it's, you know, work out? Is this a good place to meet them? Is it not a good place to meet them? By going through that process, what that means is when something actually goes wrong, you're prepared because what happens is it's like any training. Training is there and it's done time and time and time again so that it becomes second nature, so that when it does go wrong, and we had a situation in Tibet where we were interviewing a student and there was a knock on the hotel door and the we opened the door and they say, we've come to fix your toilet. And we say, toilet? It's not broken. Anyway, the student that's with us noticed one of the guys looked like a secret police guy that he knew. So we shut the door, say, don't need it. So we go, right, okay, we're compromised. We need to leave. What do we do? So we decided rushes need to go because they're the thing that would, you know, be the most, you know, give guilt to the student. So our Chinese national took the, the rushes away. Um, then we said the student needs to leave. And we knew we'd already planned that where we were meeting had various different exits. And then myself and Tash, who I was there with from Tibet, decided what we'll do is we'll just walk out casually and have lunch as if nothing had happened. Well, anyway, we walk out, everyone splits, we go to the restaurant. In some ways, we're really thankful it was full, so we couldn't eat lunch. So we had to keep walking, and then we went down various alleys and tried to check if we were being followed or not. Now, part of our security protocol was that we'd never have the numbers of people that we were meeting. We'd all go via England to India, back to Tibet. So that we'd have the daily numbers on a piece of paper. And so the last thing I thought before we were going to get to our rendezvous, as I said to Tash, OK, give us the bit of paper. You know, we need to get dispose of that. So he handed it to me. We we're in the street. And of course, we are nervous. We are you know, terrified that we're going to get caught. And so I just thought, what do I do with this? So I ate it. And then he turned to me and said, you know, that'd be my sock. So, you know, all eventualities you can't plan for. I mean, the end result of that was we buried our rushes at the top of a mountain, retrieved them. And we went back. To, we thought if they're going to get us, they'll get us when we go back to the hotel. We went back to the hotel. Everything was OK. We managed to finish that production. We got out of Tibet. But um, only about a year ago, to, uh, 13 months, I was in India on another project. And that student had left across the mountains and um, was now in India. And he told us that three days after we left, the secret police turned up and then interrogated them about who we were. So you never know. You know, we always thought this three-hour rule, we'll only meet people for three hours and then we'll leave. Did, did that matter? Did it not matter? We never knew until that moment. And then we realized all that planning, all that preparation, all these hypotheses was well worth it. Mm. OK, well, we'll come back to that in a second. We've got the second poll question now for the audience. And it's basically around uh, what type of documentaries do you film? And you can see the choices. I think there are five or six choices that you can see on the screen. So if you want to uh, fill in the answer. And also, don't forget that you can submit questions uh, to the panelists. We're going to take a Q&A at the end of the, of the webinar. So the last five or 10 minutes, we really want it to be interactive. We want to take your questions. So if you can enter those as well, we can make sure that where possible, we'll get those answered uh, today. So Jesu, in a couple of minutes, we're going to talk about the Rory Peck uh, Trust and the, you, you won the 2011 Rory Peck Award. Before I do that, Shams, you were telling me during the preparation that you've also been uh, nominated and winners of, uh, of awards at certain uh, film festivals uh, around the world um, that are really looking at kind of extreme sports. Do you want to say something about, uh, oh, that, about that? Just it's um, yeah, we submit some some of, of our work to Mountain Film Festival, international one, and there is some uh, some really good one and famous one like uh, Banff uh, or Vancouver or, or Kendall in UK. Um, and it's very important uh, for me to take part in this kind of uh, festival because it's like 
showing your work to a dedicated audience. So they are used to see this kind of action and they want to see something else than pure action clip. They want to learn something new about the character you are, you are filming. And that's, that's what is interesting in documentary for me, like taking care of characters, of telling a story. And nowadays it's maybe the most difficult part because uh, it's not so difficult to make good pictures. You have a lot of camera, affordable one, but uh, telling a story, it's uh, more challenging. Okay, so thank you, Chams. And Jesse, we're just about to see um, your short showreel film, uh, which is on a completely different subject. So I think we'll, before we talk about Rory Peck, we'll just have a look at some of the pictures that you've been creating. And maybe afterwards we can talk a little bit about the images that we are about to see. Dad, So, Jezza, can you give us a little bit more information about what we were we were looking at there, the story, the situation, etc.? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was a documentary I made in Zimbabwe with Kalisa Satoli. Um, the idea of the documentary was to um, go to Zimbabwe and, and see what the situation was like now um, after, you know, during the course of Mugabe's rule. And um, we were there undercover to, you know, we'd been given access to make a film honouring ZANU-PF and... And, um, and in the meantime, looking at what really existed. And as we spent time there, we, we discovered that um, Zimbabwe's first world education system was just crumbling and, um, and, and people were just starving as well. Um, and, uh, but yet, you know, most children, all they wanted was, a, was an education. Above everything, they wanted an education. Um, that boy we saw there was Obert, and Obert... Um, uh, needed 50p to go to school and couldn't afford it. He had to pan for gold dust to try and raise the money, but any money he got would buy them the beans or buy them a sack of maize to, to, to survive. Um, and, um, I mean, that was a difficult film to make. We were interrogated 12 times, I think, in, during the course of making that. And at one time, we actually had a, a CIO officer take our laptop and all our rushes. So I lost a week's shoot that I had to go back and shoot again, which was... Of course, the week where we, I sat with the boys under bushes for nine hours while they tried to catch birds on sticky twigs. Um, and then I thought, and then I had to go and shoot it all again. <laughs> Inevitably, it was going to be that bit, not the bit that you could stand in a nice hotel for. You know, this is, so um, it was, it was, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was an eye-opening film to make. I mean, uh, what's fantastic is the response of that film. And, and Rory Peck, uh, that was entered for the Sony Impact Award. And the reason for that was because when the film went to air, we had an enormous response from the Zimbabwe expat community and the South African community who passed on funds. We have a foundation, the Aletheia Foundation, where we support the kids in our films. And we raised so much money um, from viewers that actually Obert has just now taken his A-levels. Um, and the Grace and Michelle, who are in the film, and also Esther and Tino, they're all doing really, really well now, supported by viewers in the film. Mm. And the, the, so from that perspective, it's been amazing. And obviously, when you win an award, I mean, the importance of winning an award, really, to be honest, is it because it gives more airtime to the film. So from our perspective, the issues you're covering, the risks these people are taking from telling their stories, gets another platform. It, gets, it makes it even more worthwhile. It's not about the glory in any respect. It's about just getting more noise for the film, to be quite honest. And what the Rory Peck Trust does, which is absolutely fantastic, is supports all the people working in those countries to support you. Because I think the thing you need to really bear in mind when you're making films in foreign countries, you get to leave. You, know, you get to come back to a government that, well, we hope will support you if you get into trouble. But for many of the residents, they're living under that oppressive regime that you've just been exposing. 
So they're the ones at greatest risk. You know, they're, they're the ones that you need to think about. And that's what the Rory Peck Trust does. It thinks about the fixers, the translators, the drivers, all those people left behind who are the ones who are more likely to get into some kind of trouble further down the road, as well as supporting independent journalists in those countries. Because again, you know, you want to get news from local people. You don't want us Westerners travelling everywhere, always telling you everything. You want to see it from the perspective of local people. And that's what the Rory Peck Trust does. I think it's also a very useful tool for any budding filmmakers out there, anyone watching this who's thinking about doing their first project overseas or in the UK. They, they have um, support tools on the website. So you can get, for example, this risk assessment we've been talking about. There's a copy of one on the Rory Peck Trust site. So you can go and get an example and you can read through the sorts of questions you should be thinking about. And if you ever do go overseas, you can ring them up and say, hey, look, I'm going to this country. What can you tell me about this political environment? Do you know anybody who's safe that I could use as a translator or a fixer or a cameraman or a camerawoman or whatever? You know, it's a really, really good resource from that perspective. OK, fantastic. Now, I think we've got the results of the second poll that are in, and you should be able to see those on your screens. Uh, it seems that um, quite a few people who responded are actually in the other category, which... Uh, uh, is, uh, is interesting for us to, to hear about. OK, we'll have the third question uh, coming up uh, quite soon. So just to go back uh, a little bit, and uh, if, you, if you were to think about how things have kind of evolved since you started, you're obviously at different points in your career with different experiences, but how have things changed since you started, to, you entered the industry to where you are today in terms of the way you're, 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 you're creating your stories the equipment that you're using, etc. Mm, again, I think the the tools, the gear we are having now, are just the tools to to tell a story. So I remember when I started, it was the explosion of uh, indie filmmaking with the DSLR camera, and then Sony entered the game with the FS700, and everybody wanted to do slow motion, and it was just a new, uh, new way to, to tell a story, like sh um, showing some nice slow motion shots about, uh, uh, I don't know, anything. You, you can shoot anything in slow motion, it's always better. Uh, at this time, it was that. Um, now it's more like 4K is giving you a new, a new tool to, to, to make better images, to again, to achieve your goal. And your goal is to tell your story uh, to your audience. So um, I think it's the, the evolution is, is, is great and it's good for us, but uh, it's difficult to predict what is the next one. Um, maybe raw uh, to, to improve again a little bit your image style. We'll see. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, absolutely technology is improving and the ability to gain... You know, obviously, smaller formats are getting the same quality of image as larger formats, etc. But I think this, you've still got to know how to use this stuff. You've still got to know about light. You've still got to know about what f-stops do. You've still got to know about how to keep things in focus. I mean, because your knowledge, you know, is actually more important than what the cameras are changing. I mean, when I started out, I was using a VX1000 for my first broadcast film, 1998, Eyes of a Child. And I went out and I shot something at l uh, in the evening of a boy on a lit by a lamp and I shot this stuff and I thought it looked fantastic. And we went back to the hotel and I was a cameraman at that time. I was a production manager and cameraman. And I shot this stuff and uh, we were looking at it with the director and it, it was all out of focus. And I was like, oh my goodness, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? Anyway, we phoned back to, to, um, to the office and I'm speaking to Brian, who's a bit more of a technical guru, guru than me. And we're talking it through, talking it through, and then we realized what it was. And it was, I was totally in focus. It's just that at that low level light, you've got 9 dB of gain shoved in. And that's on a VX1000 in dV. So of course it looks soft, because the gain makes it look soft. So at that point, we, uh, we were able to go to bed. I think it was about 2 in the morning. Of course, the next day, we travel to the estate to go and film the kids, and we get out of the car, and Kate says to me, so Jezza, can you grab the camera and let's go shoot with Kaylee and the girls? And I go to the boot of the car, and uh, there's no camera. So on my first broadcast shoot, I was actually the cameraman who forgot his camera, which I've never quite lived down to this day. A hard lesson, say. I guess. But yeah. I mean, now, things are so good with 4K that it's still really easy to get things out of focus, but this time it's your fault. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's the trouble when you're dealing with F 2.8 in 4K, um, 
you've got to be really precise and you've got to learn about your tolerances and how much you move like this and you've put someone out of focus. And I think people get so caught up in that. You mentioned, uh, Shams, about that whole DSLR fever and that was classic. And it suddenly became trendy to have shots mm. that went in and out of focus. Focus tweaking, I hate it. <laughs> I, no one puts it in my films. I, I hate it with vehemently because to me, it was an excuse to get away with not being able mm. to do a job properly, mm. I think. I mean, I might be a little bit unfair. But, 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 but then we are sitting in the, in the right environment here. So at the training center, so guys can come in on the FS5 and the FS7 to, to practice their skills on the camera so that they're not on production and then running in these, uh, I will not say arrows, but in these um, difficulties to say, okay, shit, well, I don't have time, but oh, I need to shoot, so what do I need to do? So I think it's all about preparation. And, mm. and nowadays, so we have a bunch of cameras uh, for different purposes, different applications, but of course, yeah, you need to, uh, to work with them and you need to understand them. So. And your focus, um, this was a good example, so yeah. But that's the good thing, that when the brand is following the request of the filmmaker, like, um, I remember when I started shooting, um, you know, we had, we, you need to add some ND filter to slow down your shutter speed, and now on the FS5, FS7 Mark II, you have the integrated ND filter, and it's just the small tools that help you just focusing on what's happening in front of you instead of what's happening on your camera. And that's really helpful. Okay. And Shams, recently you were involved in, you were telling me quite an exciting shoot with uh, some skydiving yeah. record attempt. Do you want to, what was all that about? And what yeah, did you so, learn during that process? So yeah, we were lucky to, to go with, um, with my uh, main collaborator, Alex. Um, he's founder of uh, Satori Factory. And we went to, Arizona to, to follow 80 girls uh, trying to hold hands uh, in the sky, jumping from airplane at 6,000 meters with oxygen uh, minus 25 on top. So quite challenging for, for them. And, and we were asked by uh, Red Bull to make a documentary uh, about this, uh, this week. And it, it was very interesting because we we were able to focus on uh, characters and emotion instead of just action. And that's quite new with the Red Bull. If you go on the on their channel and Facebook, you will see it's mainly focus uh, on, uh, on action. And for the first time, we will be able to, to tell the story of two different characters that bring together, uh, can make a world record happening. So very interesting. And, and I had the chance to, to use and test the FS7 uh, Mark II um, for the first time for me. And it was, it was great because on all the small points uh, I, I told before, like integrated ND filter, a new handle, easy to carry the camera on your shoulder. Even if there is, for me, some little point to, that can be still better, like. Uh, after five days shooting with the camera on the shoulder, like maybe a piece of foam would have been nice. I will make a note. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, but um, again, this camera was because I have a S1S, mm -hmm. and at the beginning I was uh, supposed to shoot with this mm -hmm. camera. And when I had the possibility, uh, the chance to, to use FS7 II, I was happy because I knew it was, was going to make my life easier for the shooting with the uh, integrated um, input for the microphone, uh, the ND filter, the, all the small stuff that helps you, it's, it's very nice. Yeah, but, but this is, uh, so for us as a camera manufacturer, this is so important and this is the reason why we uh, talk to our customers going on productions to see how our cameras will be used wherever it's possible. So really to see, okay, how, how can we improve the products to fit better to your needs? Uh, in the different applications. So, um, yeah, always welcome uh, to tell us, okay, uh, the foam or something else, um, you know, send it over to us. Okay, so I think that um, what we found when we run um, th these webinars is we get a lot of uh, attendance from um, students in film schools and colleges and, um, and lecturers within those environments. So, specifically for the people who are really just starting out maybe trying to get into the industry, going th de deciding whether or not to go to a film school or whether to go you know, straight in. 
what would your recommendations be? What, what have you found over the years which would be a, a, a great thing for a, um, somebody entering the industry to keep in mind? What would be, you know, the... Well, I mean, I started years? out by, um, you know, I, I didn't get a degree and I couldn't get a job, so I did work experience for two months on the Chelsea Flash show. And I had no idea I was going to go into television at that point, but that's when I found it and thought, hey, this is quite cool. So um, I followed a path of trying to get running jobs and got a job here, got a job there. Eventually became a production coordinator and then a production manager. I was a production manager for 10 years. And that's when I started picking up cameras and shooting with them and editing with the, them and started editing as well. And then in 2006, I got the break to direct China Stolen Children. And that kind of launched me as a director. But I self-shoot, self-edit all my films. Um, but that's all self-taught. And that's the journey I took. However, I'd say that, you know, that is possible and that's still possible today. Um, however, education obviously gives you options. Um, so I would say that it's not bad to go to college and learn um, and have that time and have that space. Um, I actually did an H&D in the end because it's the only place the thing I could do um, in business and finance. But if you can get to do a course in media studies or whatever area or a skill set in photography or then it's worth doing just to have that space and time to grow as a person. Um, but then ultimately, when you come out, remember you're starting at ground zero. You know, have patience. I think people are too, want to move too fast. We're here where everything's got to happen, got to happen, you know, in this modern age of Instagram and, well, I'm already outdated saying Instagram probably. <laughs> um, I've shown my age. Facebook, oh my God, my <laughs> kids would cringe. Um, but, you know, it, it's about just take a step back, be patient your time because what the education will have done it will mean that you can move faster than I, I took you know I took 10 years from start to directing you can probably do it quicker but have a bit of patience sit back and grab those opportunities and learn from people as much as you possibly can that's what I say and talk to people talk to anyone you know even talking to Seb who's back there in the technical world he still has experiences he's still meeting people like us so he can recount even if he's not out in the field himself he knows enough about it so anyone you meet, you know, use, tap into their knowledge. That's what I'd say. Um, yeah. I'm going to John Jesa, like, for sure. My first tip is go out and shoot. Like, I remember I was a teenager when I started filming, and I was just filming all day long in the summertime with my friend, doing just stupid stuff. But for sure it helped me now because it was my formation. I didn't went to a film school or anything like that. And, and my second tip is, okay, the filming all the day is going to help you to improve your technique. And now you know approximately how to make your picture, how to film, how to make your frame, and be in focus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe you, now you can focus on um, what, story, what story are you going to, to tell me. So I'm watching your movie, but what do what you want me to, to see? Okay, What is your character? And I think this is one of the most important uh, aspects of the, of the job, like focus on stories and character and making at the same time a good picture to, to be nice to, to watch. Yeah, I mean, you <laughs> can, I mean you know, the great thing about mistakes, I mean, taking a camera, shooting endlessly, d making errors, making mistakes. The greatest thing about mistakes is they are yeah. the base learning tool. I mean, I can guarantee you, I ain't never going to leave a camera behind again. Mm. <laughs> yeah, <don't laughs> Done it once, I ain't doing it again, you know. So that's the great thing, you know, you, you do learn from your, yeah, and, yeah. and so playing with cameras, playing with, with the media is, is great, particularly when it doesn't mean anything, you know. I, I think that, <clears throat> sorry, um, also take, take a look into the different options in the camera. So of course, if you, if you take an FS7, for example, I think everyone would like directly to go into okay, 4K, highest frame rate, logarithmic gamma curve, and this kind of stuff. So take everything which is possible in the FS7, but perhaps it's not needed for the application you want to do. So even perhaps take a look on, on other gamma curves because they can give, the, uh, give you the result you need in a much faster way. So it's, uh, it's uh, as we already mentioned, um, perhaps sometimes, yeah, it's about practicing, um, thinking about the basis also and not try to start directly at the uh, at the highest level mm. so um, because this is also where even myself when i went to a university i needed to shoot uh, some small films and we learned about lighting and all these space stuff but this is much important uh, quite important mm. so yeah, i mean you say about planning for a trip and to be perfectly honest it's a rolling thing you know i am already looking at what cameras out there next 
thinking, will that be the thing I might need if I go and do this yeah. shoot or I do that shoot or where do I go next? You know, I was always carrying a, a, a Canon camera with me wherever I went as a stills DSLR because there, there wasn't a Sony alternative. The minute the A7S came out, that was awesome. That meant now I was Sony complete and I was using, now my latest shooting setup is an FS5 and an A7S. A7S for all my night work. And I've been filming with the police recently here in the UK and over in America. And uh, so I use the A7S in cars on a nice wide angle and then um, out there um, at night time. And I use the FS5 during the day just because it's, as Shams mentioned, the downside to any DSLR. It's just not as functionally nice to use. You know, you don't have the same buttons in the right places and it's more fiddly. Um, but, you know, horses for courses, but that's the setup now. So... It's, and so I'm always looking, well, what's next? What's next? What will work in my zone? Mm. You know, the FF7 Mark II, unfortunately, it's just too big for me. You know, I need to be smaller. I've got to hold it handheld. 90% of my stuff's handheld. So I've got to be able to hold it all day long um, and not up on a shoulder because that's just like, hey, I'm a cameraman. I need to be, you know, down here. So it's, again, looking at what you, might be useful for you, you know, for, for the projects you do. Okay, well, before we move on, we've got to the third uh, poll question. And you can see that on your screens. And the question is, what do you think is the future for documentary filmmaking? And um, we'll give you a couple of minutes to answer that. And don't forget that you can also uh, answer your questions directly to uh, the panelists today. And just as a piece of information for the crew here, the tablet that I'm using to get these questions needs to be reset. So I'm going to put it on that table and hopefully somebody can come and reset that for me. Otherwise, <laughs> we're not going to be able to get any of the questions. And that's... Uh, almost as bad as uh, forgetting your camera, I guess. Not <laughs> <laughs> so the, the question uh, we just asked the audience about what do you think is the future for documentary filmmaking, let's, let's just have a bit of a conversation about that. Shams, what have you got in your mind? What would make it, you know, where do you think things are going? What do you think would make your life easier? Uh, it's a tough easier, question. Or? It's a tough question. I don't know what is going to be the future of, of documentary. I know what is my next project, but... Um, no, I think, again, it's, I am going to, to mix everything I said before, maybe, but um, the new technologies are just tools for helping us, the filmmakers, to tell the story. So I think we are just going to, to have some better camera with some new option that gives a um, new way to tell a story, like I, I mentioned slow motion, was, it was a new way to tell a story. Uh, maybe um, the RAW uh, is going to give, um, is, is going to be on, on every camera maybe one day and it's going to be easier to post-process your images and give a new mood on, on your wall picture, on your wall film. I don't know exactly, but for sure I think it's just going to go forward for helping the, the directors and the filmmakers? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's obviously quite a general question, but, you know, I mean, the reality is, is that what makes a good documentary, well, it's like any good play. It, it needs to have acts, it needs to have a beginning, a middle and an end. It needs to have jeopardy. It's like a good movie too. It needs to have action. Things need to happen. And you need amazing, engaging characters. And that's what a documentary will always need and will always be the future. You need to find amazing characters. It doesn't matter how good your camera is, you know, 4K, 8K, 27 million K, it doesn't matter. Because if it's a boring monosyllabic person sat in a corner, it's gonna be a boring film. You know, that's the way it goes. It doesn't matter how beautifully it's shot. So I think it's about don't lose sight of what's real, re what's really important. And what's really important is character, story, unfolding actuality. I bet you a thousand pounds today that if I shot you a snail walking across that floor in 4K and then I shot you a mass riot out in the parking lot on SD, you would watch the SD riot and go, that's a much more amazing than the snail walking across the floor. So, I mean, I think you need to bear in mind, you know, what, what actually is important at the end of the day. And so what are, what are the things that you're finding that people are asking you? You know, you're talking to lots of customers on a kind of weekly basis, what are the themes that you'll find seeing in the, in the, uh, in the industry? So it, it depends. So on, the, on the one hand, of course, we are, we are talking about feature sets and functions, um, like when we had the FS700, uh, so the slow motion to, to, to bring a new 
aesthetic into how you can use the camera. Then, uh, when we, as I said, when we developed the uh, started the development with the FS7, it was more about okay, let's take a look on all the different cameras which are already released in the market and. Uh, uh, to, to, to make a much better tool, not only from the feature set, but also more from the ergonomic usable point of view. So it's, it's different. Um, it's, it's at the moment for the FS7, FS5, FS7 Mark II, uh, we, are, we are looking more from the usability point of view because the feature set is so rich already. And um, with the, with the 7 II, uh, FS7 Mark II, um, we implemented more features, uh, requested features like the variable ND filter or the uh, E-mount uh, e lever lock um, to make it even more um, flexible to use uh, for these uh, documentary uh, applications. So yeah, we are, we're still listening and getting feedback and, and see how we can make things uh, to meet the demands of the, of the filmmakers, but of course also for documentary filmmakers, cinema filmmakers, broadcast uh, cameramen at the station. So because yeah, it's it's always different uh, who we are talking to. So yeah, excellent. So we've got the results of the final poll, and the question was, um, what do you think is the future of documentary filmmaking? We had quite a few people said that it was, I think, forty percent. Um, in each category said that uh, 4K and HDR were things that you were looking for for the future um, in uh, documentary filmmaking. And as a reminder, we still have the, the option for you to uh, ask your own questions and we're going to come to those uh, in, in a few minutes time. So please keep those, those questions rolling through. So I think we're going to reach the Q&A quite soon now. And what I'd like to ask you then is your, your final thoughts, really. If you were to give one good piece of advice, we've had the don't forget the camera part and don't <laughs> rely too much on your tablet. Uh, what, what would be your one tip for documentary filmmaking? Something that you, every time, that's the first thing that goes through your mind. I must do this. Yeah. Uh, you mean a tip for, yeah, for, for people looking yeah. at? Um, I, say, I will say again, go out uh, and film, even if you don't have a FS and FS7 Mark II, you don't need that to begin uh, filming. Uh, now everybody got a phone, uh, it's affordable to buy an action cam, and you can make some great content with that at, for beginning. And then you will see what, what new gear you will need for the evolution you will have to to the new stuff you will have to buy for, for your kind of uh, storytelling and kind of filming, it's going to come after. But first, you just need to go out and shoot something. Maybe your neighbor he, he maybe has some nice stories to, to tell, and it's maybe an interesting character. Just talk to people, like Jesus was saying, like you need to talk to people, to everyone. Yeah, for sure. This is okay. something you need, you need, they need to do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd say everything Sham says, I'd say also, as I mentioned before, you know, be patient, you know, be, a, you know, go out there and push for yourself, push for your idea. Mm -hmm. Don't give up on your idea. If you have a really good idea and you really believe in it, then only you will make that happen. And there will be a point where you have to just kind of go, OK, enough's enough. But I mean, Zimbabwe's Forgotten Children it took us seven years to get that commissioned. I had a film called uh, Kids in Camps that was broadcast uh, last year and um, that took me five years to get that commissioned and I literally wiped it off my laptop when it then got commissioned. Yeah. So, you know, be pers persevere and be patient. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'd say is, you know, if you do travel overseas, think about what you put in your hand luggage. You know, keep, your, uh, keep enough to be able to shoot on arrival. Mm. Spare pair of underwear, yeah. always handy in your hand <laughs> luggage because you never know when you're going to lose your bags and a plastic cafetiere and a nice load of real coffee. <laughs> That's what I take everywhere. Yeah. Okay. And no, like, may, maybe, yeah, I take care of so what I'm going to bring in my, uh, in my luggage, but uh, be perseverant is very important. Like, uh, when I begin, like, uh, I was at home like this and waiting for a phone call to have a job and get some money. So it's very hard. And even because most of the time I have some um, people think ah, yeah, you are traveling around the world, it's so easy for you. Like, yeah, of course I'm only posting on my media, on my social media, only nice pictures, but there is lots of, of 
hard stuff and hard job before that and many days of work at home in front of my computer, uh, setting up the project. And, and it's not easy also for, for the people around you. Like uh, my girlfriend I'm, is not um, seeing me a lot of time. I'm always uh, on other countries. So, so it's, be perseverant is a very, very good tip. Like it's not going to be easy, but if you want it, you can, you can make it. Mm. And it, anything to say from your side? Um, I, I think on, on the one hand side, so yes, if you, if you have a, a good story, so really make make it and don't don't give up. So I recently just talked to a documentary filmmaker, and he a couple of years ago he read an article in the, in the magazine. He said he was so blown away because uh, so in a negative way he said, okay, I need to do a documentary about this topic. It's so important that everyone knows about this. So it took him three four years, and now it's on. On, on his on screening, but um, so first of all, if you say okay, this is so important, and I want to do a documentary, don't give up. So okay, make all the uh, all the uh, science and uh, the risk paper, of course. And then on the other hand, uh, so from a Sony perspective, um, as I said, uh, yeah, work with your camera and l uh, learn about the feature. And um, again, because we are sitting here in our training center, um, I, I can highlight this. So talk to us, come to us, and uh, we are offering uh, the support for, for these courses so to, that you can get the best out of your camera, so FS7, FS5, and other cameras as well. So yeah, okay. this is what we are supporting. Yeah. Perfect. So time's flying by. We've only got a few minutes left, and uh, we're going to go into some questions and answers. I think we've got quite a few questions have come in. Uh, before we go on to the Q&A, um, I'd just like to say... Um, before we do the Q&A, thanks for, uh, for joining us. We really do appreciate you taking time to, uh, to spend with us this afternoon. Um, you can still join the conversation using uh, hashtag Sony Video Production. So join the conversation in that way. Uh, please don't forget to fill out the, uh, the survey at the end. It's very important to us to find out what, uh, what your reaction is and what you think are important subjects for webinars uh, of the future. Um, so the first question we've got is, uh, we've talked a lot about acquiring pictures. And the first question is about how important is sound and what are you specifically uh, thinking about and working out when you're planning the sound aspect of your uh, documentaries. So right. who wants to kick that one off? I can start. It's, yeah. it's, it's funny because um, I make a whole uh, short movie about uh, sound uh, in paragliding. And it totally changed my vision of sound uh, for for movie, because like like before doing documentary, or uh, I was making more like short clip, short action clip where you just have an action and uh, nice music and okay that's it it's it's working, uh, and I, I discovered this sound world like um, it's really like at the same level than the images for me. Uh, you have the, the picture, but now you have the sound, and it's really important to take care as much as you can of this aspect. The sound is really important. So the easiest way is to bring a sound engineer for me. <laughs> I have a friend <laughs> who is doing an amazing job. Um, but yeah, sometimes he is not uh, able to be here. So, um, so yeah, just asking him some advice uh, about, okay, what I can do to improve my, my sound uh, on this shooting and trying to make his job as easier as I can. So Shannon's in the world of luxury. I don't even know what a sound recorder <laughs> looks like, quite frankly. Um, so I self-shoot, so obviously I do the sound too because it's me. On most shoots, it's just myself and a translator or myself and an assistant producer or producer working with me alongside and it's normally a woman because we're dealing with children and and um, I like to be a mixed um, unit if you like and um, and that's important whether you're filming with young girls and things I think um, so uh, and and so basically it, all the sound I'm running myself through through the camera and through my earphones and so it's about again devising, you know, a couple of different microphones. One that's more directional on the camera. One more. I never use on-camera sound. I'm using Sennheisers, 
um, one's more directional than the other, and then I'm running radio mics as well. And so most of the time it's about running radio mics and taking a lot of batteries with me so that you can put them on a subject and leave them on there. Because if you want to get, you know, the heart of a true good documentary is obviously it's much nicer to learn stuff unfolding in front of you rather than interviews. You know, I use interviews only when I have to, you know, to get key information across. Otherwise you try to do it where you cover it naturally or through conversation. Therefore, again, it's about being able to put a mic on someone and stepping back. I don't want to be on top of people all the time. So therefore, radio mics. And then it's, again, just using little techniques of we've putting blue tack on there. I don't you do it like this because you've got a nice big black thing sticking there. So I'll put blue tack and gaffer tape on the back of it. Or, you know, you can get um, special fluffies for inside shirts and things. But you just need to be careful of materials. You know, nylon's going to scratch. Cotton's much better. So it's, again, just trial and error, you know, trying little things out. I mean, there's all sorts of things I do that aren't, you know, if you look at my FS5 camera setup, I've got a homemade sponge pouch thing that pushes against me to hold the camera steady. I built that myself. I bought carbon rods and designed it all. So it's about finding little ties that can hold a cable here, and the same with sound. It's about finding ways to maximise um, the usage, because obviously, particularly with an English language film, you, the sound is as important as the picture, because you need to hear what people are saying. Mm. Um, foreign films, you can get away with a little bit more, slightly dodgy sound because you've got subtitles. Um, but again, yeah, it's a, it's a really critical part of the whole setup. Okay, and the second question, I think this could generate a, probably an extra hour's worth of conversation, <laughs> is based uh, around uh, what are your tips for good storytelling? So that's the second question that's coming. So it, obviously we haven't got very much time, but a couple of key points around story. Well, story, any good story. I mean, look at, look at a book that you watched, you read, and you thought was amazing. Look at a film you watched, and you thought, and what was it that it was, you'll find there are engaging characters? So find engaging characters. Find a subject that, you know, an area of, of subject that's either hidden un, slightly under the news headlines, that's a subject that's really important, that's a social purpose to it, but you're not really hearing about it. Um, find good characters contained within it. And then look for what's going to happen. People get, what people get caught with is retrospective narrative. Retrospective narrative is when you're telling, someone's telling you something that's already happened. Well, you can only do that for the first seven minutes of your hour-long documentary. From then on, it needs to be about what happens onwards, forwards, what's going to unfold, what's going to happen in the life of that person that you're following. Certainly for the sorts of documentaries I make, obviously, if you're making a film about the migration of lions... You know, you're not going to get, you know, but you've still got to look at where do they migrate? How do they migrate? What happens? What happens in their journey? You need to think about what will, what will I film over the next eight months that's going to capture it? You can't just have people talking about what went on before. And that's a big mistake people make when they go in to make event-based documentary. So it was about, say, when I went to Gaza to tell the story about the Israeli insurrection, you know, it, the first six, six minutes of the film can be about what happened and being attacked and blown up or whatever, but then it's about what will happen to those kids over the next eight months, because that's the real story. You know, that's what the film's going to... That's going to be the heart of the film. Mm. So. And uh, finally, I think we've just got time for one more question, and that's basically where can the viewers find... Uh, go to to find and view your work? So we had a specific question about the uh, your Zimbabwe film. Whereabouts is that? Is that so, online or...? Yeah, yeah, if you go to truevisiontv.com, so that's www.truevisiontv.com, or you search my name, Jason Newman, that's N-E-U-M-A-N-N, -N, um, then you'll find it through those two searches. Um, and, and that's where you also find information about the Elithia Foundation. That's the foundation we set up to help the kids in our films. But okay. the Zimbabwe film, yeah, absolutely. And all the information about what's happened to the kids in the film afterwards is all there on the website. But True Vision's website um, is the best place to go to. Okay, and Shams, for your work? Yeah, like uh, I'm more um, addict to social media. So... Facebook, Instagram, website, um, uh, we are on all these platforms. So just uh, type my name or Satori Factory and you will see uh, all of our work. Okay. Well, I think we're out of time. We've gone over the hour, which is quite amazing. It doesn't seem five minutes since we started, really, but it's always great to get a good conversation going. Seb, I don't know if you want to add any last minute thing or you're, you're okay? I'm okay. Fantastic. So what I'd like to do is. Um, Obviously, I'd like to thank you for travelling to Pinewood Studios in our Motion Picture Centre thanks today. To you. Thanks to yeah. uh, it's been a fascinating conversation, and uh, I'd like to, you know, thanks very much, and for Seb also 
flying over from Germany very early this morning to be here to offer some insight from the Sony no point of view. Well, thanks uh, to everyone who signed yes. in to watch it as well. Yeah, so, yes. definitely. Yeah. So, we, of Thank course, you. we appreciate uh, you, you taking the time and um, we'd like to say thank you. Hope you found it interesting and uh, we look forward to maybe welcoming you to uh, another webinar from Sony in the not too distant future. For now, all it remains for me to say is uh, thanks for watching and hope you have an enjoyable rest of the day. Thank you.